The number one postpartum complication is a postpartum hemorrhage, also called PPH for short. We have to look at the risk factors for postpartum hemorrhage because the nurse must be aware in order to recognize when she may need to be more alert for postpartum hemorrhage. We use the four T's acronym for TONE, most common cause of postpartum hemorrhage. This is also called uterine acne, and that is when the uterus does not contract as well as it should or contract down. It's also maybe termed subinvolution. The next T is for tissue. Tissue refers to retained placental fragments. It is the most common cause of a late postpartum hemorrhage that is not always apparent in the first immediate uh, postpartum period. So this would happen like on day uh, two or the next day after delivery. So postpartum uh, retained placental fragments. When you have retained placenta, the uterus cannot contract fully. It leaves openings of the vessels that were attached to the placenta and therefore you have the postpartum hemorrhage. The next T is for trauma. Trauma is related to operative deliveries where forceps were used or lacerations. Now this is not gonna be bleeding that's coming directly from the uterus, but it's coming from wounds that were created during the birth process. Thrombus formation is related to pre-existing conditions, whether she had HELP syndrome, preeclampsia, or thrombocytopenia. So these issues have are creating a risk factor for postpartum hemorrhaging. They create postpartum acne, which does create postpartum hemorrhage. Now we've highlighted the causes, and now let's look at symptoms of a postpartum hemorrhage. She saturates a pad in 15 minutes or less, has heavy vaginal bleeding. Lacerations and forceps injuries can be discovered by trickling and oozing of blood from the vagina. Uterine acne is a boggy uterus. It's, it's very soft when there's uterine acne. You should massage it to make it firm. Passing of blood clots that are larger than a golf ball size. Return of lochia rubra, the bright red bleeding, after lochia has progressed to serosa or alba. Cool and clammy pale skin and tachycardia and decreased blood pressure indicate blood loss. Let's look at nursing interventions for postpartum hemorrhage. To prevent postpartum hem hemorrhage, we recognize our risk factors. Pretty much everyone gets 10 units of Pitocin, IM or IV, after delivery. If they're at risk, then they'll get 20 units of Pitocin after delivery. The first thing you're going to want to do is funnel massage in the presence of uterine acne. That's the most important nursing intervention you can provide at this time once you discover that there is a hemorrhage going on. Massage the fundus until firm. Get their vital signs. Apply oxygen and start an IV or make sure the IV that they do have is patent. Replace with IV fluids. Assist with any blood replacement. Elevate the client's legs to increase venous return. Make sure the bladder stays empty. You may need to insert a urinary catheter to empty the bladder. Notify the physician and obtain lab work if indicated. Medications that may be given to help control the bleeding is oxytocin or pitocin, methargen, and hemabate. Remember not to leave the patient if she is unstable. You use the call light system to call for help. Endometriitis is also known as a uterine infection. It is the most common postpartum infection. It shows up between days two and five postpartum, mainly evidenced by a temperature greater than 100.4. She also may have flu-like symptoms with chills and fatigue and maybe even a loss of appetite. Her heart rate will also be tachycardic and she may have purulent lochia, although purulent lochia is not always apparent immediately. Other sites of infection could be any wounds from cesarean inc incisions, episiotomies, lacerations that were repaired, or any other trauma or openings that could lead to infection. It's a nurse's job to be um, observant and vigilant into determining the signs and symptoms of a postpartum infection. So you really just have to look out for temperature elevation greater than 100.4, 
uh, the flu-like symptoms and tachycardia in any odors or uh, discharge that is purulent in nature, any redness or swelling around incisions. So these are just the common things that we should remember, and we don't have to initially n learn or know the whole list of things that can cause infection because mainly just, just the process of birth itself can, call, can put the woman at risk for infection. So we just have to look for risk factors and signs and symptoms. Thing we want to be aware of is that uh, with a retained placenta can develop into an endometriitis or uterine infection. That also happens if the placenta had to be manually removed. So we would look and worry about postpartum infections with retained placenta. Sometimes we don't always know that the placental fragments have been retained. Uh, there may be like little pieces and they just miss it in the placental exam afterwards. So we would have to watch for temperature elevation, um, chills, fatigue, fever, we have to watch for those things. They, all those things always point to infectious process. Another one is just UTI. Uh, women after childbirth have a very high risk of developing UTI, so we always assess for those symptoms of a urinary tract infection. Let's look at mastitis and how this infection affects a woman's breast and how it affects breastfeeding. And it's very common, so let's talk about that one. So mastitis is an infection of the breast tissue. It's when milk stasis, or milk that is engorged in blocked ducts. So it's a blocked duct, and the trapped milk will cause an infection there. Signs and symptoms will include painful or tender, tender localized hard mass. It'll be reddened area, usually on just one breast chills and fatigue and flu-like symptoms. It's very obvious to assess and diagnose mastitis. So as a nurse, we will just have to provide teaching and treatment. One thing we need to do is teach proper latch technique for breastfeeding because cracked and sore nipples can lead to an infection. So it's very important that they have a good latch when they're breastfeeding. So also they can empty the breast of the milk and we won't have the milk stasis in the ducts and that will help prevent and treat mastitis. We wanna encourage rest and, and um, pain medications like Tylenol and fluid intake of at least 3,000 milliliters per day. So they need to have uh, increased their fluid intake. They will need antibiotics. Antibiotics is a, one of the treatments that's given for mastitis. Educate mom to keep the breast clean Allow nipples to air dry, to not use soap. She can hand express some breast milk to put on her nipple. Um, we want to prevent milk stasis, so she needs to completely empty her breast. Use ice packs or warm packs on the affected breast for discomfort. We um, want her to continue breastfeeding at least every two to four hours, especially on the affected side. This will not affect the baby, so it is okay if she breastfeeds while having my status. She needs to wear a well-fitting bra for support and she needs to complete the entire course of antibiotics. 